to know. That's important. Yeah. One thing. Kai, do you need more light? Or are we okay? Be, okay? I didn't want to blind everybody with like suddenly not to come. Sure, absolutely. So John Boswell died in 1994, and I know many here are too young to realize that the average home did not have a digital platform at that point. The average home didn't have a home computer, and the average home didn't even have a digital camera for another five years. So there's very little precious film that's been digitized of the image of John Boswell. And as a filmmaker, I had to make a decision on what John Boswell meant in my own life. And in my own life, he was the light bearer. He literally, like Indiana Jones or like um, a Tom Hanks character uh, in the, uh, the films, was just a person that revealed not secret truths, but buried truths. So in segments of the film where we had his voice, but we didn't have his image, I made that as an artistic choice. It, people either love it or hate it, so I have heard, I've heard both. And I will say one of the struggles of trying to work on this biography in Boswell's collection, because he was at the sort of start of computers and was just converting a lot of his stuff to computers, there are probably three or four dozen floppy disks at Yale that they just haven't converted yet. And so even, even some of his own things uh, haven't been, they, they were digitized but haven't been sort of converted so that they can be made available. So we have the kind of old analog VHS recordings. So it probably won't surprise a lot of people here that there are one or two homosexuals within the Catholic Church. <laughs> Feel free to laugh. Um, there, there were many people that absolutely supported him. There were many people that gave him exact locations of some of the liturgies that he was able to capture, um, but very much on the down low in that era. Um, and I'm sure he won't mind I mention this, but uh, I'm attached to the film, really. Aaron Loshway just passed away. And he passed away on Easter, which I thought was pretty profound. That was uh, John's priest. <clears throat> and even as out as Aaron was in his life in the last 30 years and a married gay man, even Aaron Washway wasn't out when he was John's priest. So that truly was the, the world of the 1980s and 1990s. It was very covert. And that really makes John Boswell an amazing hero of the LGBTQ community. The fact that he came out in 1970 as a proud gay man and said, you know, I'm going to just work through this and make it work is absolutely astonishing when you look back at how the world operated back then. And I will say, in his papers, there are, you know, there are several narrators mentioned letter after letter after letter after letter from people who, whose lives were probably changed. And many of those were from clergy. And um, there were clippings and you know, various you know, like notices for his speeches and stuff. And, and several people, after he died, sent kind of like public conversations that were happening uh, in newspapers about... You know, there's the, there was the one story in the film there about like the notice of the Vatican, you know, how to refute John Boswell. That was, that was apparently not all that uncommon. And so 
even if there weren't any supporters sort of high up in the Vatican, there were quite a number of um, sort of lower level priests and such that were part of a conversation and were at least open to Boswell scholarship and many more who were quite supportive. Um, there were a number of Catholic churches who were very open, um, even if they couldn't be publicly affirming, uh, were very open in their ministries to LGBT people. So John passed away Christmas Eve of 94, and after that, Jerry survived up until the mid-2000s. I think 2009-ish he passed away, and he died of cancer. Um, Pat Boswell, John's sister, uh, was still very connected to Jerry, and I believe was actually with him as he died. So there was definitely a familial connection that um, continued past John's death. Sure. Um, I would love to hear if you could speak on maybe what in particular about the Catholic Church uh, was also uh, drawn to. I know I said that he was expressed interest in converting when he was 10 as 12, which seemed really amazing to me. Um, and he was already a raised Christian, so I was wondering what in particular about the Catholic Church. From my vantage point, it was that his true love of life was history and historical record. And what better place to go than the place that has it all locked up in these crazy old archives, you know? Um, I love the fact that the Tom Hanks movie like showed that vividly, that you know, there are men in black suits with black ties and earpieces that guard those things because they have, the Lost Ark is probably there. I mean, let's be real. If it exists, it's probably in the Vatican archives. So I think that Boswell, through his research, just made the connection between the heritage of Christianity, the keepers of the history, the historical record. And I think he just wanted to be part of that. I think he, he needed to be part of that. What, and what would you think? Having read some of his journals from that, uh, from that moment, and some of his letters and... Um, so Pat, I think, was very kind when she said he had a flair for the dramatic. <laughs> he was a very dramatic teenager. And like his, his journals are full of like pained musings about, you know, like death and sin and Catholicism. And, and so I think he's, I think early on at least, he was very drawn to the drama, the ceremony, the high church. Um, there was a particularly fascinating letter where he writes about a friend of his that is that is into Episcopalianism because of the high church, but I am Catholic because I am a true believer. And so I think initially he was very much drawn to the drama of it. And then through that process of the reading and the history and thinking about the kind of longer history of what the true church was, uh, what, and, or what, what he believed the true church was, came to that position. So I think it was both a love of history and I think had a kind of genuine spiritual experience there. Because he wanted to convert, as, a, as young as 12, I think he started the process at 15. And I think 16 was his first, like 16, 17, I think was his first communion. And so um, that was during the time he was learning other languages and he was very interested in history. And so I think all of those interests kind of converged in, in his conversion. But he was, you know, deeply faithful his whole life. You know, they, I forget who it was that said he was a daily... Not penitent. Com Communicate, thank you. Oh my God. Um, and so he was, you know, his, his conversion was genuine and he, you know, was very devout his entire life. But I think it was, you know, like Craig says, it was, it was the history and I think it was also the drama. And I think in that he found, he found a lot of room for himself and people like him through that study and through the kind of relationship to the church. Yeah. Oh trying to figure out my question as I talk about it, but I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, like, I would say about the challenge, I guess I'm asking, did you find it a challenge of making a film about, for 
first of all, an academic. I mean, we all know, those of us who are professors know when we talk about what we do, sometimes we just bore the crap out of most people. <laughs> so, like, about making a film about an academic who studies medieval history and religion and is Catholic, like, there are lots of things that could have made this incredibly boring, and it wasn't at all. Thank and you. so, like, I wonder if you ever thought, like, can I make this interesting to people? You know what I mean? Sure. Sure, I do. That's a great Maybe question. I'm just sensitive about no, talking no, about no, no, no. It, it, it's a great question. Uh, Kai and I lived in Southern California until just May, and I don't think we could have gotten into a room by saying, We've got this great idea for a documentary about this egghead guy that spoke and wrote 14 languages, and oh, by the way, he was gay, but he proved this. I, it probably wouldn't have opened a lot of doors. Um, what I can tell you is that as a young gay man, in the city of Houston in the mid-1980s when the mayoral election occurred and the mayor that was in position was positive to gay people and the old boy mayor that they were bringing back said shoot the queers to get rid of AIDS, um, that sparked my own activism and that launched me. The next morning I actually went to City Hall and signed up as a voters registrar deputy and I registered people to vote in the gay clubs as a young gay man. And finding Boswell's work at that same time helped me bridge my own quest for integrating my sexuality with the historical record, the Christian faith that I had grown with and that my whole family was intimately involved in. It actually gave me um, the strength and the energy to refute their concerns, um, ultimately and to share that with others and that I carried forward for a good 20 years in the advocacy work that I did. So I, I kind of had skin in the game just from my own personal um, experience and Kai and I actually have a television series um, totally unrelated and while we were waiting for it to go from pilot to series which can take years unfortunately we decided to put together a documentary feature about kind of like the genesis of homophobia in the United States because no one had ever done it before. And I thought that was a glaring omission in the canon of you know, documentaries. So in so doing, I wanted to just put a, just a dab of John Boswell in it and not make it too churchy and you know, not turn people off that were drawn perhaps to the topic. So I think in the 76 minutes of the film, there's about a minute and a half, maybe two and a half minutes, talking about John Boswell and his work. And when we went around the country to the film festivals with that film, we had more comments on, hey, I've never heard of that John Boswell guy. What can you tell me about him in Q&As like this? So I shared what I had. And later, we decided to uh, pitch a television series called Sorry We Missed You. So when you go home at night and the UPS or the FedEx guy has been there, you have that little sticker on your door that says Sorry We Missed You. So we created a logo with that and the idea behind the series was that there have been many great people throughout history that have done extraordinary things and for whatever reason modern life doesn't recall them or doesn't give them you know, the onus that they should have for their hard work. So. When we did the pilot, I chose John Boswell, so we did like a 24-minute um, episode, pilot episode for that, put that out in the film festival circuit, and we we're accepted virtually by every film festival that we submitted to. So we knew from the future documentary with the two minutes of John Boswell, followed by the half an hour pilot episode that got into virtually every film festival that we entered, that there was a deep interest in the topic, and Pat Boswell actually found us through the pilot of Sorry We Missed You, and we started about a year and a half conversation just as friends. We would Zoom maybe quarterly, and you know she put the idea in the back of my head early on, if you ever wanted to come out with something longer, I'll introduce you to people that might be able to help round it out. So, we actually began with the premise of the 30-minute pilot and then broadened that scope um, with his friends and relatives that were still living and able to uh, share their, their stories with us. So that's kind of in a nutshell. Thank you. That's a great question. So uh, thank you again for, for creating this and bringing it here. Um, the, the film did touch upon his time at William and Mary, um, but I would be curious. 
curious to hear more about you know in your conversations um, with with the folks who knew him throughout his life. What role did what what, what kind of roles did this place play for him? I guess you know what what was the the importance? You know, why why did he choose to come here? And like what kinds of experiences was he having here? I guess we heard a bit more about what he came out of it. So I can share what Pat Boswell shared with me, and she was actually um, on the film festival circuit with us at a few film festivals. She was at one in Boston, and a similar question came up. And she said that when we go to college, we come into our own. You know, we actually begin our adulting in our college experience. And that this was probably the happiest he had been in his entire life up to that point. And that, you know, he had been in drama in high school. Um, he did writing here. He was actually published here. He did a poem. Um, so I think it was the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, there's something in the soil here that really helped him grow and become the person that, launched him into the PhD program in Harvard that he more than likely wouldn't have been as well prepared for had he not been here. But Pat literally said these were the happiest years of his life. I'm going to make a plug for the history department. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the history department that, you know, which you know, it is partly true. You know, he, and, and we were not his first choice. He came here because of in-state tuition. Uh, he wanted to go to a school in Connecticut. Pat told me the name one time, and I completely forgotten it. Um, but his parents said, in-state tuition or nothing. And so um, that's how he ended up here. And, but you know, to, to your point, Pat, you know, th these were the happiest years of his life. And part of it was because of, the, because of the environment. Part of it was because of the history program. Part of it was because of, you know, he could expand his languages, uh, the people he would work with. Um, and he also, from what I can tell, just reading his letters and stuff, he began having relationships and had moved away from home. And even though he couldn't be openly queer like we are today, he had gay friends who were locals. He had gay friends who were, or who were fellow students. And so I think it is, the, it is the college experience of just kind of coming into his own as an adult. It is the academics that we could do here in the history department. And he could be more openly gay than he could be in Petersburg. And so all of that kind of coming into his own as a, as a fully formed adult person and finally getting to be. And he had had, I think he had had relationships before in high school, but hadn't been open or really, he was still trying to kind of accept himself. And so I think here, being away from home, being at college, he could kind of run his own life basically. And he could, you know, go to the church that he wanted to, he could have the relationships that he wanted to, he could have gay friends that were separate from family, he could have academic friends that were separate from family and, and the academics and it all just kind of ended up being the perfect place for him to nurture um, the scholar that he would become. George. One reflection, that one of the faculty members who taught Jeff here told me once that he had two sort of reactions to teaching Jeb in class. One, that he was always at a heightened state of awareness because Jeb was in front of him and thinking in everything attentively, critically, alertly. And the other thing was that once he had to explain, and I apologize in advance for using a, 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 a difficult word, but had to explain the formal etymology of the English word cunt. And um, Jeb just took it in and said, oh, okay. And this professor thought he was going to, you know, shock the whole class. And Jeff was the least impressed of all, and just sort of let it roll through. Um, so those are two things. If I could just offer one point to demythologize something about Jeff, his linguistic abilities really raised eyebrows in America, not so much in Europe. Um, I'm a working medievalist. I work in six languages routinely. That's okay in my field, but it's sort of standard equipment. Jeff Wood had about three times that, so he was really, really good. Um, but it's not supernatural. It's sort of what a damn good medievalist should be able to do. So 
He was really impressive among our crowd of peers, really impressive, but not supernatural. And it's really Americans who are shocked that two, three, four languages, that's unheard of among us. It's not in other professional circles. And I think it's, I think it's Ralph that says he was in, in somewhere that he was wickedly funny and erudite in 17 languages. And, and, and going through his collection, I'm also, I've always been very impressed with just how much work he could do. Like, in the late 80s, he's battling AIDS, he's chairing the history department at Yale, he's supervising 22 graduate students. <laughs> I've got one honors thesis that I want to give up. Um, <laughs> he's keeping up regular correspondence, he's working on same-sex unions in modern Europe, he's regularly writing amicus briefs for various court cases around the country. Uh, people discharged, especially from the military, and he's doing all of that stuff and like maintaining a family life and you know maintaining relationships with with uh, family and with friends and with graduate students and traveling and having fun. And so I think if his language ability isn't supernatural, I think that level of energy is is approaching supernatural. I can't drink enough coffee for that. <laughs> um, I guess this is an unrelated question, but building off this. Um, theme of like how prolific he was. I, I found some of the connections you were drawing, um, and that a lot of the folks who were speaking were drawing between his his work primarily on like queer history, but then also this this piece on child abandonment. You know, drawing upon then even in his dedication, you know, these themes of um, family, queer family. I think that's really beautiful. And I guess I'm just I'm curious if if anybody knows any more about the um, academic or more popular impact of that scholarship? I have, there's so little of him that was digitized and so little of him that was on videotape, but there is one hour and a half lecture um, online that's still available and he dives into kind of supporting the church for their certainly medieval outlook on the family, basing it on the fact that in the medieval times, incest was so rampant that in a small village, it could lead to inbreeding and negative health consequences. Um, so I know that he had like multiple layers of consideration that led him to support the Catholic Church as much as he did in that respect. And the fact that, you know, he became an expert on the abandonment of children in the medieval ages out of that interest and wrote that huge tome of 400 plus pages as well. And um, as one of the speakers mentioned, that it was as, you know, earth-shattering as his work in homosexuality was, just because, I guess, there hadn't been a whole lot of interest in considering that at the time. That, that's about all I've got. And I think, you know, also given when it is published, the, the idea of the heterosexual nuclear family, couple of kids, has been assumed timeless. And part of that work is family structures are variable. And family structures have always been variable. And the Catholic Church is much more roomy than we give it credit for. George, have you read that book? I haven't read the yes. book yet. Yes. And one of the things that John Jeff never gets credit for is being a prose stylist. He wrote really, really well. And I read all the footnotes, two-thirds of the way up the page. And they're well written as well as anything in the body of the text. So his ability to write clearly and beautifully and engagingly, um, he doesn't get enough credit for it. And I think that's one of his historic strengths. One of the things I want to call out to you guys, and it's, it's buried toward the end there, um, in the Mel White section where Mel White is arrested and ironically, although I don't believe in irony, I guess, and I certainly don't believe in coincidence, John Boswell's younger brother is the one that arrests him and takes care of him while he's in jail. Um, 
it's mentioned in Mel White's like public statements on John Boswell's death that while many of us, and I include myself in this because I was doing this at the time, you know, are picketing in front of buildings and out on the streets demanding change, young people get to the libraries. You know, we've just lost our beacon of hope at that time. I mean, his, his research was that important because no one else was stepping forward and offering it to us. And it was really a clarion call from Mel White to say, it's great that we're all out on the streets and starting bonfires and picketing the CDC. And you know, all those things are important, but don't forget, get into the libraries, carry on his tradition. So, you know, all of you that are here are, you know, in an exceptional place to be able to do that. Well, it's eight, oh. Ooh, time for one more. Is there anything in the documentary that, or that you did not put in the documentary that you wish you had? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, there were a few more people that wanted to be involved in the project, and the timing just wasn't right for interviews. Um, and also, as a director, a, a film is already at two two hours, if I had included a couple more people, it definitely would have gone over that. So yeah, there, there were a few folks that I would have loved to have had involved in it, but it just didn't work out. So that, that's the only piece, just a couple of the folks that I think could have assisted to give even a better shape to it. And for friends, relatives, um, we have a cafeteria plan. No, I'm teasing. Um, the film has entered distribution. Um, it's available on Amazon Prime right now. It's for rent or for purchase. I know your students. It's on Tubi. It's free. There's four commercials. Send them to Tubi. I don't care. And I will There's be requesting copy. the library buy physical copy and streaming <laughs> access as well. So sometimes that takes a little bit to, to get through. But. Cool. Well, it is 8 o'clock on a... Tuesday night, you know, thank you all for, uh, for coming and for taking part of this and thank you. Hopefully we can sort of continue conversations about Boswell as I write about it. <laughs>